All right, folks, welcome in. It's another brand new edition of the 901 Soccer Podcast, and I'm your host, Lawrence Docker. You can find me on Twitter at LDoc93. You can find the 901 Soccer Podcast on Twitter at 901 Soccer Pod. You can find Bluff City Media on Twitter at Bluff City underscore media. You can find us on Facebook as well. Not on, just search 901 Soccer. We'll pop right up. Search Bluff City Media. We'll pop right up. And of course, um, if you're watching this, you're already there. But if you're not watching it, if you're listening to it, subscribe to Bluff City Media on YouTube. Um, remember, uh, I might be your favorite Bluff City Media host, but I'm not the only Bluff City Media host. I say that slightly tongue in cheek. Um, but, you know, I'm not the only show, so you should definitely go and check out all the other guys doing all of their stuff. You got Sane doing a lot of Grizzly stuff. You got Tiger stuff. You got football, you know, a lot of excitement for Memphis Tiger football coming up this year. Could they get into the college football playoff? Plenty of that as well over at Bluff City Media on the YouTube and as all of the uh, – all of the people who do stuff on YouTube like to say, you know, run down the checklist of rate, comment, and subscribe. Um, I do appreciate on those occasions when people do take time to comment on uh, on these particular not on one soccer podcast videos on YouTube. I'm always sure to uh, reply to the comment. I do appreciate it. Uh, so far, it's been all positive. I'm sure eventually we'll get to a point where somebody says something negative, and I will handle it appropriately at the appropriate time. Stumbling over my words there a little bit, but uh, no matter. So what we got for you today, um, I know on uh, Saturday evening, following the Memphis Nine Odyssey's win over the Pittsburgh Riverhounds, uh, I, I tweeted out podcast recording tonight and going up Tuesday. It's still going up Tuesday, but uh, there's a little bit more light coming in the widow than you guys are used to, which means it's not Saturday night, but that's okay. There was a, a one or two little technical issues, which we were able to get resolved, thankfully, before Tuesday. And so here we are on Monday recording it. Uh, so that, that would explain why I'm not in a little bit more professional attire, but that's okay. Um, here talking 901 FC's big win over the Pittsburgh Riverhounds on Saturday night. It was the first fireworks game in 901 FC history, and perhaps quite appropriately, 901 FC is putting up some fireworks on the field. Uh, 901 FC wins 2-0 on goals from Marlon Santos and Oscar Jimenez. And um, before we get into that, I just, I feel like I need to say that I feel vindicated. And the reason I feel vindicated is you guys know me. In the past, I've been very hard on this team. And in the past, and I'm not, I'm sure this won't change at any point in time. uh, When things aren't going well, it's very easy for me to get down. you know, there's the old saying, and I'm sure he wasn't the first one to say it. He's the first one I ever heard say it, but Eric Hasseltine, the radio voice of the Memphis Grizzlies, always likes to say, you never get too high after a win, and you never get too low after a loss. And I've, I'm fairly certain that I've said on this show before, I have tried that, and it doesn't work for me. And that's just the way that my sporting brain is wired. So for this year i have actually been quite successful at applying that little piece of life philosophy um maybe it's because i was just so high on the off season that the team had that uh it's you know like the sunken cost theory or the gambler's fallacy uh where i had spent so much emotional capital thinking it was going to be a great year that it was going to be impossible for me to acknowledge that it wasn't going to be a great year until it was too late um you know, if the if the bad run of form had kept up, I would have I would have probably gotten there. But at this moment in time, I have been vindicated because if you'll recall, all throughout that rough stretch, I said, guys, it's going to be okay. It's not time to panic yet. Uh, and I think I feel like I said, if we get to if we get to the end of May and it still looks like this, then it's time to panic. Um, here we are. It's the end of May, and things are much better. And I think a lot of the credit, you got to give a lot of credit to Coach Glass, uh, to Caleb Patterson Sewell, and to the players. I don't, I mean, I don't get any credit for that. I get credit for being vindicated and, and, and being correct and telling everybody just relax, it's going to be fine. Uh, I don't get any credit for, for the turnaround because here's the deal um, they weren't, the results weren't there, but they weren't playing poorly. It's a little bit frustrating. Yes. Uh, five, five losses in, in a row in league play. That's, that's a tough pill to swallow, but you know the first half of the inning game was really the only only 
stretch where they looked bad. It's the only time you could say they looked bad. And as uh, Caleb Patterson Sewell has pointed out on several occasions, look, they were still top top five in the league in chances created. And, you know, when he put it this way and I thought about it, I was like, oh, that makes sense. But bad teams don't create that many chances. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Bad, bad teams are just bad. Um, and that, excuse me, that wasn't 901 FC. So, and that is something that they have been. And I think uh, a big, big reason for the guys not getting down, and you could see it in the in the in the media availabilities. You know, immediately after the game, yes, they were frustrated because they're prof- they're pros. That you know, they don't like losing. I don't blame them. I don't like losing either. Uh, but but you could see it that that uh, just just talking to them, talking to Coach Glass, I'm just like there there wasn't any panic in the locker room. They weren't down. They weren't frustrated more than they should be, you know? And so I feel vindicated because now we're on a run of four wins in the last five games, five games overall and beaten in league play. That's four wins and a draw, that draw being on the road. You always like to get points on the road when you can um, and take care of business at home. Of late, they've been, I believe they've won their last two home games. So you had uh, – it all started with the win in Birmingham. Then you got the big win at home against Tampa. Went on the road in an absolutely wild, bonker, crazy game. Finished 2-2 at Monterey Bay, which was a little bit of revenge considering they had just beat you at AutoZone Park. Um, then you won with the last kick of the game against the El Paso Locomotive. You come back and beat Pittsburgh. And it's I feel like beating Pittsburgh is kind of the cul- – I don't know if culmination is the right word, but it's probably is, – is a is – a, is a breakthrough of sorts, despite the solid run of form heading into the Pittsburgh game, because Pittsburgh had been kind of a jinx team, kind of that boogeyman uh, for you, because you'd, you'd never beaten Pittsburgh at AutoZone Park. You were 0-3 against the Riverhounds at home, and you had struggled in Pittsburgh. Your one win against them was at Pittsburgh, and I had completely forgotten about the one win when I was a guest on a show in Pittsburgh last week. Um, but now I don't want to see rolling right now. They're one of the hottest teams in the league, in no small part to Marlon Santos. Marlon Santos is playing like a man possessed right now. Um, when, when he scored again, A, another great goal that probably figures to be goal of the week candidate just from outside the penalty area that there wasn't any goalkeeper that was going to stop that. Uh, we'll get to the uh, Pittsburgh goalkeeper in just a second. But uh, Marlon is, is a man possessed, and – you know, you think about it, that's one of the questions that Coach Glass has been asked several times of late has been, what's the key to Marlon firing the way he's firing right now? And he says, well, we we're playing him in position because at the start of the season, they were real thin on the back line through a combination of injuries and suspensions, and you were having strikers play as defenders. And typically, um, I don't really subscribe to the – Oh, he's being played out of position narrative, unless it's a situation like that, you know? Oh, well, he's an attack. He's a defensive mid and he's being asked to play as an attacking mid. No, I don't buy it, but you know, striker being asked to play defender. Yes. I can, I can see why that is a legitimate claim to being out of position and credit to him for being a good trooper and doing it. But now that he's back where he belongs, he's, he's causing problems for everybody. Uh, Coach Glass said it after the game on Saturday night. If there's a player in the league who's had a better better May, I'd be very surprised, and I would be too. I don't think there's anybody in the league that's had a better May than Marlon Santos. And his run of form goes all the way back into April um, when he was creating all sorts of problems for Birmingham down at Protective Stadium. He got two assists in that game to Bruno Lapa, who didn't play, uh, but he was, it was just a nine off for him uh, is, is what, what we were told. So uh, just a, just a nine off uh, for Bruno. And Bruno is the other guy who in this in this nice run of form has been absolutely on fire. It's, it's been him and it's been Marlon Santos. So they have uh, both been playing very, very well. And have, as a result, 901 FC has been climbing all the way up the standings. And, you know, I, it's kind of surprised me when it got mentioned in the press box on Saturday night that uh, if 901 FC's result, had, when we were told it was at some point in the second half and it was two to nothing, um, and we were told that if that result held and all the other results around the league held as well, we were going to wake up on Sunday morning and then 901 FC was going to be in third. And sure enough, we wake up on Sunday morning and then 901 FC is in third in the Western Conference. Now, I think there's like two points separating third and tenth. Uh, so that's that's wild. But, um, hey, we're winning games. We're getting points. We're climbing the standings. We're in third. 
stay there the rest of the season. <laughs> okay. I would like a third straight year of a home playoff game. And uh, I don't see any reason why it can't because I was high on this team coming into the season. Uh, I kept the faith, which admittedly for me is, is very hard to do. Uh, I'm, it's very easy for me to get discouraged. That's probably why it's a good thing that I'm not a, a, a making high level executive decisions such as hirings and firings and signings and starting lineups or anything like that. That's why I'm a guy on the internet talking to you. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's, you got Marlon and Bruno are playing just outstanding right now, but I would be remiss if we did not also mention Oscar Jimenez getting his first goal in a 901 FC shirt. And it was a great finish. Uh, kudos to him for, for being there. Um, I do think Pittsburgh's goalkeeper probably should have done a lot better with it. Um, you can't get beat at your near post like that. That was, that was, that was not very good goalkeeping, I must say, but, uh, uh, Dylan Borsak, I don't think should have to apologize for catastrophic Tampa Bay goalkeeping on his goal a couple weeks ago. And I don't think Oscar Jimenez is going to apologize anytime soon for bad goalkeeping from Pittsburgh on his goal. Uh, nor should he. Um, if, if, if you don't want the other team to score, perhaps you should play, uh, better as a goalkeeper. Uh, as such, I don't want to see got the two Oh, win. I would also be remiss. I mentioned Dylan Borsak just now, Dylan Borsak. I say this, uh, Slightly sarcastically, but also slightly seriously. Dylan Borsak probably might need to be up for save of the week for 901 FC. As, as nice as the scoreline looked, uh, one thing that uh, I think does need mentioning is that Pittsburgh got their fair share of chances. They weren't very, there weren't a ton of real clear cut, oh my goodness, type chances. Excuse me, but they put, they put a good amount of pressure on 901 FC. Uh, not only did almost score an own goal in the first half, but Dylan Borsak had a goal line clearance. Um, that's why you put a guy on the post and he was just right there. Although I, I did find it just a tad interesting that it was the forward all, on the goal line, but Hey, it works. So who cares? Um, and he cleared, and he cleared the ball and I'm going to give uh, Steven glass his flowers here real quick because he made two substitutions in the first half. And usually that is something that you that is either injury necessitated or, things have just completely fallen apart. Uh, the one that springs to mind is uh, Bob Bradley in the 2010 World Cup round of 16 for the U.S. against Ghana, subbing Ricardo Clark off in like the 29th minute because he was absolutely shambolic. Um, so I got also, what, what's with all the substitutions in the first half? And I was like, I, I don't think they're injuries, so I think it's got to be tactical. So that's something we asked about after the game. And, and he said, look, Pittsburgh was really starting to find their way into the game. So I felt like I had to pull the trigger and make those subs. It's not a reflection on any of the guys that were out there. They were doing really well, but we just had to change something up. So I'll give Coach Glass his flowers for this. How many times do we see, not just in soccer, but in football, basketball, hockey, baseball, tennis, whatever, do we see people wait until the mistake happens to make the change? You know, in football, it could be, I keep playing this quarterback and he's not very good, but he keeps winning. And then we take a catastrophic loss and now I make the change and it's too late. Or, uh, you know, I keep running this guy out there in my starting lineup in basketball and he's a, he's a net negative player, but we keep winning games. And all of a sudden we lose the first two games in a playoff series. And then I make the switch and it's too late. So credit to coach glass for seeing that things that Pittsburgh was maybe starting to to find their way and making some tactical changes before it became a problem. That's, that's I don't know if visionary is the right word, but that's very clear forward thinking. So kudos to him. And it paid off because right in the first minute of the second half, they got a goal and Pittsburgh was never able to, to really get into it and create very much in the way of clear cut chances. Another thing I want to talk about from the game was the attendance. Attendance for the game, 3,020. Best crowd, like you see, since the season opener. That's a five straight game. It breaks a streak of five straight games that were below 3,000. That includes a U.S. Open Cup game. Um, do want to talk about a little bit about the open practice that was held at Micros. Uh, unfortunately, last year they had one here at Snowden Grove in South Haven, which is about five minutes from my location. Unfortunately, I missed that one. I was in Washington, D.C. for a work conference. Um, which was a great conference, and, and we're going back uh, to that same conference in a different city this year. But uh, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, they, they, they finally do the stuff that you ask them and you can't be there. And it's extra frustrating because it was 
five minutes from the house. It's where I referee my rec league games on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, so I was really glad to see that they brought the open practice back this year. And I don't know how it could have gone any better. I mean, I guess there could have been more people, uh, but they had a great crowd out there. Um, and the kid, you could tell the kids were having a blast. The parents were, 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 were having fun. You know, the, I was told there were over 400 people out there between parents, kids, fans, saw some of the mafia out there. Shout out to those guys. Um, there's a good, good contingent to the media channel 24, channel 23, uh, channel 24, channel three, La Prensa Latina, myself, Pete Pranica was there. Um, they, you know, we got to talk to coach glass, Caleb, we got to talk to less than Paul and it's not just, they're not just doing the open practice and resting on, on that successful though it was. Um, they're doing a bunch more stuff They're doing a coaching clinic in June. They're doing, uh, some, uh, targeted Hispanic. They're going to try and make more of an effort to go into Hispanic areas of town and get those people involved, which is, you know, that's something we've all been asking for essentially since day one. And you thought, you know, with that Pachuca game in 2019, that that's something they were trying to do. And then, you know, COVID happened and blew everything up. Um, but this, this year, look, the attendance being 3,020 this Saturday, in addition to the fact that it was up, it felt like a lot more. Um, now, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to be like where you see this all the time in the Memphis sports scene, and it drives me crazy and makes me want to put my head through a wall. Uh, this is not a ticket scanners weren't working because, guys, let me tell you something. Nobody uses scanned attendance. Nobody. Not one single team, organization, team, club, school, country, national team, cricket, golf tournament, none of it. No. Nobody uses Turnstuck Hound anymore. It is sold, distributed. So 3,020, because you're looking out, and this is where I'll say with 901 FC, it has always, I have always gotten the sense that what is there is, 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 is what relatively closely matches what they're telling me. Um, oddly enough, this Saturday was the one where I felt like maybe the number that they gave me was a little low, but um, they, nobody, would, nobody would sell 5,000 tickets and then tell you, only 3,000 people showed up. They would just tell you that 5,000 people were there. Um, it, was a, it was an atmosphere. I spoke with Jay Mims at halftime. You know, he said, we got, we got a proper atmosphere out here tonight. And absolutely, we did. And I think the open practice was a big part of that. I think the fact that the team is winning was a big part of that. I think the fact that it was a 7.30 game instead of a 3 p.m. game was part of that. The postgame fireworks were nice. I think that's going to that's gonna bring people back. So they're, they are trying. And again, like I said several times, it's going to take time for the attendance to get back up. You're essentially having to undo three years, maybe four, of neglect. And they, they, they're they busting their ass. From Jay to Caleb to Stephen Glass to the players, like everybody. Like this, this feels like everybody is all in. It's a team effort, and they're all putting their heads together, and they're all out and about doing what they can. And that's all we can ask. And if the city doesn't respond, then the city doesn't respond and that's a different problem that we have we have to solve. But for right now, they are they are doing what they can. I think the community events are are paying off. It's also worth noting. It is also worth noting that the showboats, you know, the sixth or seventh different iteration of non NFL, non college football football in Memphis. You know, the previous five or six haven't worked. This is going to be the one that works. Okay, there, Jimbo. Um, Attendance for the Showboats game at the Liberty Bowl, excuse me, Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium on Sunday, 1,094. I, I just, I feel compelled to point out that that is lower than any crowd in Memphis 901 FC history. The lowest crowd in Memphis 901 FC history was the Open Cup game against Miami United this year. That was like 1,400. Um, so at what point do we need to maybe, does the community, the, the 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 media core, the whoever you want to call you whatever you want to call it, whoever. At what point do we need to just stop pretending that they matter? Because let's face it, nobody goes to the games. The team is terrible, and they're not even based here. They're based in Texas. How are you going to be the Memphis Showboats and do all of your community events in Dallas and Fort Worth? That was a real thing, by the way. Um, so. Uh, for all of the guff that 901 FC gets from the, the haters, 
uh, from the people that get mad that 901 FC was included in the big ask for a soccer stadium. Um, you know, and they're like, oh, well, nobody goes to the games. I, I noticed nobody ever levels that accusation at the showboats. I noticed that people, uh, you know, there's, there's like, it's a concerted effort to take them as a serious professional football team. Um, 1,094 on Sunday. Um, I'll let you draw your own conclusions from that, other than the ones that I've already just told you you should draw. Um, on top of that, this kind of ties in with that. We've got the summer of soccer is is officially upon us. I, I believe this past Saturday against Pittsburgh was the what I am claiming is the official beginning of the summer of soccer for us here in Memphis. Um, you've got the Euros going on in Germany starting June 13th. You've got Copa America here in the U.S. starting June 20th. you got the Olympics in Paris at the end of July. And both U.S. men and U.S. women have qualified for that for the first time since 2008. Um, and on top of that, between now and the first Tiger football home game at the end of August, there are seven more Memphis 901 FC games. In fact, this upcoming month in June, you've got a stretch of three straight games and four out of five at home. You got four home games in June this year. It almost kind of mirrors that stretch last year. You got June 8th at 7:30 against the Switchbacks. You've got Wednesday, the June. You got three games in eight days at AutoZone Park. June 8th against Colorado Springs. Wednesday, June 12th against Rhode Island. Friday, June 15th against New Mexico United. Unfortunately, I will miss the game against New Mexico United. I know, unfortunately, that's already the second game I've missed this year, uh, but I was picked to go represent Mississippi and referee at USYS President's Cup in Plano. Uh, so that's that's I missed the Ben Pierman homecoming game last, last year because I got picked to go referee at regionals. Um, it's a great learning experience. I'm not going to pass it up. Sorry, guys. Um, but I'm, I'm still here for you. I'll still be able to, I'll have my computer with me. I'll, I'll put together a preview and I'll have access to my phone. So I'll put the, I'll do the wake up flapjacks. It's game day. I'll do the moment of silence for champions if we win or the not thrilling, but nice if we draw or God forbid the, uh, I am sad if we lose, but you got three games in eight days or in the early to mid part of June. And then June 28th, you got Phoenix rising at home. And then you've got only one in the month of July. Uh, that's July the 27th against San Antonio. And then August the 3rd against the El Paso locomotive who you just beat and got their coach fired. Um, and then August 17th is the last 901 FC home game before tiger football season starts. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. You got seven home games in addition to all the soccer that's going to be on TV this summer. And this is something I've been pushing this. I believe that this is going to lead not to an attendance explosion, but you know, we went from 2000 and change to just over three with this last game. And I think it's going to start creeping up, creeping, not drastically, but creeping. And if it goes up, it goes up. I'm not going to complain about it. I don't think anybody else will complain about it. So that being said, um, you should definitely go over to the Bluff City Media website and check out a piece that I wrote on the best places to watch the summer of soccer here in Memphis. Uh, and just off the top of my head, I know the list includes, well, you know what? No, I'm not going to tell you who the list. You can figure two of them out for yourselves because there's two that are, are, are the usual standard go-to soccer bars. And there's a couple of oddballs on there, but I think you'll, you'll, you'll read through the whole list and think it's probably a pretty good list. So you should definitely go check that out. You should also definitely go check out my write-up from the open practice last Thursday. Again, that's over all over there at Bluff City Media on the website. And it's going to be a lot of fun. You think back to the summer of soccer in 2016, where you had Euros in France, you had Copa America here in the U.S., and then you had the Olympics down in Rio. That was a lot of fun. Um, two big differences. One of them I already mentioned. You've got both the U.S. men and the U.S. women qualified for the Olympics, so that's going to be a little bit more of interest already. Uh, I think maybe there might be a trade-off there with the time zone difference. Obviously, Brazil is only an hour ahead of us, whereas Paris is five or six hours ahead of us. Um, I don't think it's going to be that drastic of a trade-off. People will have no problem watching European soccer. Uh, the, the, the numbers for the Premier League, the Champions League, whatever you want to call, whatever you want to uh, refer to, are always spectacular. Well, not, maybe not spectacular, but always very good. Um, 
The other big difference for us here in Memphis is that in 2016, we didn't have a USL championship team. We have a USL championship team now. And that's awesome, right? I think it's going to feed off of, they're going to feed off of each other and it's going to build and it's going to build and it's going to build, right? Um, that's my belief. And I'm, I'm until it happens or doesn't happen, I am sticking to it. Um, I think that 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 stretch in June, I think, is going to is going to tell the tale. But I'm also I was supposed to have heard back last week, but haven't yet. I also have a, a pending application for a press pass for the U.S. Panama game in Atlanta, uh, which I believe is the 27th of June. So that'll be I think that's a Thursday. And then I got to get back here next Friday for that Phoenix Rising game if I'm not mistaken. So that'll be, that'll be interesting. Hopefully if I, if I get the uh, common ball, leaving things to the last second, but um, you know, that's, we're in the, this is, this is, I think probably going to be the golden age of soccer in America. And what I mean by that is the amount of high level tournaments coming here in a very short period of time, Copa America this year, right? I mean, hell, if you want to go back to last year, you could even say gold cup last year, Copa America this year. Next year, we got the Club World Cup coming, plus the Gold Cup. And if reports are to be believed, like you're going to have Gold Cup west of the Mississippi River and Club World Cup east of the Mississippi River. So maybe Nashville, with the largest soccer stadium in the country, who also got screwed out of hosting World Cup games. I understand this is a Memphis audience, but and I understand not everybody in Memphis is fond of Nashville. I get that. Trust me. It's okay. Um but how many times in your life do you get to see the World Cup three hours away from where you live? That's This may be the second time in my lifetime and a lot of your lifetimes that the World Cup is in the United States, but that's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, if you think about it, for the World Cup to be within driving distance from you. Um, and not just a, like a day trip, but like an up and back. Um, sure, you get for World Cup, you've got Atlanta, Kansas City, Dallas, and Houston are going to be the closest um, but Nashville, that would have been, so they got screwed because Bob Kraft is buddies with Johnny Infantino. And they said, sorry, Nashville, we're putting it in Foxborough, even though nobody there cares. And trust me, go back and look at all of the, the Twitter feeds, the Facebook feeds and the YouTube channels for all of the local news stations when Boston or excuse me, Foxborough got named as a world cup host city, no acknowledgement of it whatsoever. None. Um, you go to places like Houston, Dallas, Seattle, Kansas city, you know, wherever, Everybody was all over that, not Boston. Um, but so maybe Nashville will get Club World Cup games. Uh, you know, they might get to see like the Moroccan champion take on the Australian champion. I don't know. Um, but that's still going to be cool. And then obviously, so Gold Cup last year, Copa America this year, Gold Cup and Club World Cup next year, World Cup in 26. I was hoping for Women's World Cup in 2027, but U.S. soccer pulled out of the bid and said they're going to bid for 2031. I guess – they want to stick it to the Chinese because um, I think China's already confirmed a bid. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I was hoping for, for all of the soccer in this many years in a row because in 2028, the Olympics are in L.A., which means U.S. men's and women's Olympics, uh, Olympic soccer, plus, you know, Mexico, probably Brazil, you know, all, all the big guns. I think one of the largest crowds in American soccer history was the 1984 gold medal game at the Rose Bowl. Got like 106,000 people. Um, so... There was a dream that was five straight years of five high-level international tournaments, and, and we didn't quite get that, but it's still going to be incredible. I think it gets gets really rolling this summer with the summer of soccer. You got Copa America, you got Euros on TV during the day, Copa America at night, and then for us here in Memphis, the fact that we get to watch all of that, which Memphis did in 2016, there were a lot of places that were very packed, but now we've got a professional team, a USL championship professional team to support as well. I think it's going to be a match made match made in heaven might be too strong, but you're going to have, there's going to be overlap. Everybody's going to benefit from it. That's my belief. Um, and Hey, who knows if nine, I want to see keeps winning. If they stay the hottest team in the league, you remember this time last year, they went on a 12 game unbeaten run. Who's to say we can't do it again. We're, we're almost halfway there already. Five games unbeaten. One more game. We take, if we, you know, we get a result in San Antonio this Saturday, that's six in a row unbeaten. We're halfway to what it was last year. Um, so I think that would be, 
I think that's it's going to be a lot of fun, guys. I hope everybody's ready to have as much fun as I am. Uh, but I think that is going to wrap it up for us here tonight. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, everybody, for going to the game. You guys made a difference. That was something you could feel just walking around on the concourse before the game. You could feel it. And that hasn't really been the case much, probably since the two playoff games in 2022. Um, like, you could walk around and you could feel there was a buzz and an excitement. And I'm sure there was a little, it was a confluence of, excuse me, of, a, of several factors. But it meant like it, it, it felt like a lot more than 3,000 people. I was thinking we were going to get to four. That's what I was thinking. Ended up being 3,020. And that's fine because, you know, when you hit rock bottom, there's only one place to go up. Last year and really the first part of this year, attendance wise, I think was rock, I hope was rock bottom. And I think we're, we're, we're starting on the upswing. And I think the summer of soccer is really going to help boost that. And if the team keeps winning, what's the saying uh, that that's the oldest saying in Memphis. I've always doubted. I've always doubted the veracity of it, but Memphis will always support a winner. Well, 901 FC is the hottest team in the league and they've been to three straight playoff appearances. Time to put your money where your mouth is Memphis. Get out and support this team because they deserve it. So thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm your host. I'm Lawrence Docker. You can find me on Twitter at LDoc93. Find the 901 Soccer Podcast on Twitter at 901 Soccer Pod. Find Bluff City Media on Twitter at Bluff City underscore Media. Over on Facebook, it's 901 Soccer and it's Bluff City Media. On YouTube, it's Bluff City Media. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, and then head over to the Bluff City Media website to check out most of the stories on there right now, funnily enough, because there's not a whole lot else going on, which is another reason you should all get down and support 901 FC because it's the only game in town right now. It's a number of the most recent articles on the website are previews, recaps, and other soccer stories. Uh, previews from myself, recaps from Taylor Thompson, uh, open practice, best places to watch, um, you know, stuff like that. So you should all head over to there. And if you want, you can get some merch. You can get in the Discord. Uh, we'd love to have you in there. Uh, it's a good, good group of folks that we got in there talking all things Memphis sports all the time. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we should probably, I, I would say, we'll talk to you at the early part of June.